before we start, a couple of you emailed me to say you couldn't find the video podcasts. Um, uh, the issue seems to be that uh, when they moved us into these new lecture theatres, they basically put the latest videos into a separate folder on your, your video podcast. So you'll find two uh, folders which are labelled slightly differently, uh, but you'll find the latest ones uh, in here, and the old ones are in the previous uh, folder. So have a look for those two different uh, folders. So there's this one, and then there's this one. One is labelled slightly differently. So they are all on there, so just uh, persevere and have a look. <coughs> so we said we're now going to start thinking a little bit about the energy budget of the Earth. This is important for a whole range of scientific problems, all the way from weather forecasting up to, for example, looking at those components of the Earth's energy budget we can make use of for, for example, assessing the efficiency uh, and opportunities for using parts of those heat budgets as components of renewable energy sources, which we'll look at later. So it's important to understand how the heat budget of the Earth works, what the components are, how it affects the temperature across the surface of the planet, and where, for example, we might want to build solar panels, wind farms, etc., etc., and how we can look at the efficiency of those different structures, uh, which we'll look at later in the course. So this is a sort of picture you should, should be familiar with if you're not. Try and draw it yourself and go through the different components. You'll see it in various IPCC reports in various different um, uh, incarnations, but it hasn't really changed since the late 1990s, which is where this one comes from. So effectively try and remember we have on the left-hand side our incoming shortwave radiation, and on the right-hand side we have to balance that with the outgoing long-wave radiation as we discussed in our simple model. Now, the problem is that the long-wave components actually have quite a lot of complicated pathways. And one of the interesting things you'll notice as we go on is that some of those components are very large, comparable to or even larger than the incoming solar radiation. So let's just remind ourselves, in terms of the incoming solar radiation, the number you should generally remember is 342 watts per meter squared. Remember, that's our global average. It's not the same all the way across the surface of the planet in reality, but this essentially assumes that we have the Earth at the Sun-Earth distance, and that's the average for the whole planet. <coughs> so 342 watts per meter squared is the incoming solar radiation on average, and of course that has to be split up. Remember we're going to lose about 31% of the incoming solar radiation, about 107 watts per meter squared, due to essentially reflection. A large fraction of that, 77 watts per meter squared, comes from clouds, and about 30 watts per meter squared, on average, comes from the global surface. So that reflected component produces 107 watts per meter squared, and that pretty much defines the global average albedo. Remember, it's an average. There can be quite a lot of variations across the planet, obviously. We send quite a large fraction of that incoming solar radiation, the short wave takes it all the way to the surface. Before it gets there, of course, a significant fraction, not particularly large actually, but a fairly large fraction, about 67 watts per meter squared, is absorbed by the atmosphere. And that contributes, as we'll see, to the eventual long wave components that we see on the right hand side. So eventually we get 168 watts per meter squared on average absorbed at the surface. And the word surface encompasses a wide range of different materials. So of course, those different materials are going to absorb at different efficiencies. They're going to then start to increase their temperature. We're going to have conduction going through into the surface. And of course, we're going to have to try and then lose that radiation because as the temperature increases it wants to re radiate back so we have to balance everything. So if you look up at the top there, 342 minus 107 reflected gives you 235 watts per meter squared. So that's the outgoing long wave radiation from all these different processes here. And that effectively is the top down if you like um, energy balance that we always have to try and remember. The complication of course are all these different components. 
Now remember we said that uh, once the surface uh, essentially starts to heat up, we have all these various different processes which we'll talk a little bit about, including these non-radiative processes, such as uh, evaporation and convection generated by contact of the air with the surface. But you'll also notice that we have this very significant component uh, due to absorption in the atmosphere by greenhouse gases. We do have some of the outgoing long-wave radiation, as we mentioned, going straight out to space, more or less, about 40 watts per meter squared through, remember, that atmospheric window at a peak of around about 10 microns in the infrared. But, of course, we've got this complication of absorption in the atmosphere by all these various components which we'll go through, and then we've got basically 165 watts per meter squared coming out of the atmosphere in the upward direction, but we've got this large component coming back down the back radiation of about 324, which in our simple model, remember, remember led to a warming of the surface radiation, because if we just use our 235 watts per meter squared to calculate, the satellite we're measuring that, the black body temperature of the Earth you get something like minus 19 degrees C, which is much, much colder than the average surface temperature of the Earth. There are also various other components in there which we'll just go through, and there are a number of comments in the next slide which we'll make sure you want to be familiar with. First of all, you have to remember that clouds can absorb radiation, not just reflect them. They can emit thermal radiation, but the balance between the emission and the absorption depends upon their altitude, how cold are they with respect to the surface. So they can absorb and emit thermal radiation, but by and large they tend to cool the planet on average because they're very good reflectors of shortwave radiation. So the net effect of clouds is to effectively cool the surface. Now that 235 watts per meter squared is an interesting number if we were to integrate it across the entire planet of the, uh, the entire surface of the planet, we'd end up with 120 petawatts. That's 120 times 10 to the 15 watts. So that's the total energy that we have available. And the question is, can we make use of that? To put that in perspective, a 1% change uh, of that order would be around about 2.5 watts per meter squared on average. And that's about equivalent to or larger as any other present man-made energy inputs. So small changes can lead to large effects, and actually man uses a relatively small fraction of that energy budget, as we'll see. Okay, so these are the comments then that we just went through, so make sure that you're familiar with those. Uh, uh, the basics, remember the equilibrium temperature we calculated, the surface temperature, which is not the same as the actual surface temperature due to the so-called greenhouse effect. So let's think a little bit more about what happens at the surface. So the surface is made up of lots of different materials, from ice, rock, soil, and that partly reflects or partly absorbs the incoming radiation. That absorption is obviously going to lead to an increase in the surface temperature of that material. material. That heat, has to, that energy has to be lost so it's got to be balanced by the shortwave input, by an outgoing longwave radiation output. And that's combined from the conduction into the ground and essentially generation of convection due to the contact of the air just above the surface. And that convection is extremely important. So if the surface, for example, has water on it, it's damp, or if we're talking about a, a, a lake, a river, etc., then of course we're going to get evaporation occurring. And that's one of the indirect radiative effects. So we're going to let basically produce lots of evaporation, and that's a very efficient way of actually removing heat through evaporation. And actually evaporation is an excellent way of transporting heat through the atmosphere. Of course, the surface may also have vegetation on it. And actually, that vegetation is actually going to use some of the incoming radiation, obviously for photosynthesis, to convert into biomass. And it's actually been estimated that about 5% of the incident solar radiation, actually about 12% of the visible part, is used by vegetation to produce biomass annually. The radiation uh, that's reflected, you know, is strongly dependent on the wavelength of the radiation. 
in the near infrared, for example, the vegetation, leaves, etc., are actually very good for reflecting. About 40% of infrared radiation is reflected by vegetation. It absorbs about 60% of the available sunlight. So if you were to stick a small infrared filter on your iPhone camera and take a picture of some green leaves and trees, they'd actually look extremely bright, just like that. So vegetation has evolved to be quite reflective in the infrared. However, very dense forests tend to absorb quite strongly about 70% of the radiation. They only reflect about 17%, as we mentioned, because overall they have a very low albedo. It really depends upon the density of the vegetation and what we call the leaf area index. So they reflect about 17%, very small, and they transmit to the soil about 30% through to the undergrowth, which is why ecosystems underneath these big tropical forests, for example, have evolved to adapt to these quite low light levels. And indeed, if you were to view the planet in the infrared, it would look very different. Okay, so let's do a little bit of revision to remind you about some of the units and magnitudes of those um, eight budget components. Remember that if you were to simply measure at the top of the atmosphere in space using a solar panel or a detector, the average solar radiation is actually about 1367 watts per meter squared. That's at the mean position of the Earth to the Sun, perpendicular to the solar Earth beam. Remember the Earth is spherical, so a lot of the planet's surface is obviously inclined at an oblique angle to that incoming solar beam. So that solar flux density of 1360 watts per meter squared is going to be spread over a much larger surface area compared to the perpendicular area. So the flux per unit area is significantly less than that value, which of course is what we call the solar constant. So it's going to reduce as we move away from the equator. Seasonal and latitudinal variations are, remember, driven by variations in that solar constant. And of course the average solar zenith angle and that's going to depend upon the latitude, the season, and of course the time of day. So bear all that in mind, because we're going to show some graphs in a moment. Now the, I should say amount, sorry, the amount of solar radiation reflected to space without absorption depends on that uh, solar zenith angle, and as we mentioned it depends on the properties, the albedo and the absorption quality, uh, properties of the local surface, and of course the atmosphere, which we discussed previously. Now, when we discuss the contributions of those radiative processes to the Earth's total energy budget, or energy balance, we tend to use, as we said, the average global value at the top of the atmosphere, which is S divided by 4, because we're dealing with a rotating sphere. 3, 4, 2 watts per meter squared is the number to remember there. As we said, the planet absorbs 70% of the instant solar radiation. Some people prefer to remember the actual units, some people prefer to prefer to remember just fractions. So let's just look at the fractions. 70% of the incident solar radiation, the short wave, uh, is absorbed in one form or another, and we get a reflection of about 30%. That's our albedo. 50% of the incident short wave solar radiation available at the top of the atmosphere reaches the surface, 50%. And then it's absorbed there at the surface. 3% is absorbed at the stratosphere level mainly as we discussed by ozone and molecular oxygen. Only about half a percent is absorbed by water vapour and carbon dioxide. So those are actually relatively small quantities in the stratosphere. Once we get into the uh, troposphere, things obviously get a bit bigger in terms of the molecular uh, concentrations. 30% is absorbed in the, tro in the troposphere. That's mainly again due to water vapour, 30%. Then we have about 3% absorbed by clouds. And, I've got, and then, of course, we've got carbon dioxide, ozone, and oxygen also contribute to about 1% of the absorption. Now, if you look back at those figures of the energy budget and the different components, the most striking feature is the internal exchange between the atmosphere and the surface by those long wave flux components. They've got the largest magnitudes of all, larger than the insulation at the top of the atmosphere. 
That's why it's so important to understand them, because they lead to what we call the natural greenhouse effect. Now some people, as I said, prefer to think in terms of fractions or units, so you can convert that previous diagram if you want into this picture. So this effectively is just percentages, 100 units equals 342 watts per meter squared. So on the left we've got the solar, on the right we've got the long wave radiative. So you can see we've got the uh, effectively 100 units coming in, 50 is absorbed at the surface, 17% is absorbed in the troposphere, 3% is actually absorbed in the stratosphere, we have 30 units reflected back out to space. Over here, when we look at the absorption, remember we've got to think now about the troposphere and the stratosphere separately compared to the surface. Effectively, we've got 110 units going out. We've got 98 absorbed from the surface. 12 goes straight through. Of that 12, two is then absorbed in the stratosphere. So eventually we get 10 units going out to the top. But then of course that absorption has other ramifications. We're going to essentially radiate away. 60 units are emitted up, uh, 149 units are emitted in total, 60 upwards, 49 downwards, back to the surface. Of that 60 going upwards, 6 is then absorbed by the stratosphere, so 54 gets back out. And of course the stratosphere is also going to radiate Six effectively goes upwards, five going, goes down, so that's 11 in total, so we've got yet more absorption in the troposphere as a result. So if we add all those up and compare with the previous figure, you should end up with the same numbers. So if you prefer to use this figure compared to the old one, that's fine, I don't mind. But of course, we've got all these components <coughs> in here we have to think about and how they interact. And we also need to think a little bit about the non radiative effects. So the one on the left here is the sensible heat flux from the previous diagram, and this is the so-called latent heat flux due to the, essentially, conversion of water vapor to uh, liquid, etc. So what those figures show you is the significance of what we call the natural greenhouse effect. So what are the main contributors? Well, we've already talked about those. The main contributors in the long wave are water vapour, clouds, carbon dioxide, ozone, nitrous oxide, methane, and a few other minor constituents. Water vapour and clouds contribute 80% of the greenhouse effect. Only a small proportion of the upwelling liquid, uh, long wave radiation sorry, uh, passes directly into space through the <coughs> atmospheric window. We have a very strong downward emission of that absorbed terrestrial radiation, following <coughs> absorption of that terrestrial radiation, from the atmosphere, mainly the troposphere. And that drives those small, relatively small diurnal changes in surface temperature. Without that downwelling radiation from absorption, the land surface temperature would cool very, very rapidly at night, and it would warm to extremely high temperatures during the day. Remember when we compared the Earth's surface temperature variations with that with Mars, which has a very, very thin atmosphere, the temperature variation on Mars is much, much larger, simply due to the fact that we have no long-wave absorption downwelling radiation due to our nice thick atmosphere. So the greenhouse effect is key to not only maintaining a relatively warm surface temperature, but it limits the amplitude of the diurnal variation of that surface temperature, particularly over land. And again, just to put that into picture form, so remember we've got daytime on the left, nighttime on the right. During the daytime, the short wave radiation is generally obviously bigger than the long wave on average. And so the temperature of the ground as it absorbs that radiation heats up, uh, up so it's actually greater than the air just above it. And that generates lots of convection. And of course, any water vapor in the air is eventually going to produce clouds. And that's actually an extremely good way of transporting energy. We also, of course, have conduction into the surface as well, depending on the type of surface. At night time, of course, assuming there are no clouds in the way, the temperature of the ground is actually much less than that of the air temperature, because the short wave has now been switched off, and we just have this upwelling long wave radiation. So the surface undergoes what we call radiative cooling, 
And of course, if that temperature difference is large enough, you can get formation of fog, dew, etc., etc., etc. Of course, then we have a complication in that the ground may actually have a lot of water on it, or we may be looking at lakes, etc., etc. So the short wave during the day, of course, is still greater than the long wave, or we have these other processes due to evapotranspiration, which can essentially contribute to the energy transfer. Now, we said that the average value we talked about actually changes significantly with latitude. And that's actually extremely important for a whole number of reasons. So if we take a look at the average radiation as a function of latitude, so here's the equator, north, south pole, to the left and right. The top line shows the instant shortwave radiation. And you'll notice it's a maximum of the equator, as we said. Um, it's got an average of around about 342, so somewhere around about here, which corresponds to about 35 degrees or 40 degrees north and south. Okay, so that's the average. But you notice, of course, that it decreases significantly as we move towards the higher latitudes towards the pole. So that curve represents the instant average shortwave radiation at different latitudes on the planet. Now, if we then measure the outgoing normal radiation to space in the same way, you will notice that again, of course, the average, the maximum of the equator, and it increases as we move towards the poles as expected, but it doesn't line up. We look at the absorption, sorry, that's the dashed line, I should have said. This one, I can reach. It doesn't actually line up with the uh, long wave radiation back out to space. So this line, the dark one, is the outgoing long wave radiation to space, but it doesn't line up with the absorbed short wave radiation. There's no balance. And indeed, you'll notice that the long wave radiation to space, the outgoing long wave, or OLR, is actually less than the absorbed short wave radiation at the equator, whereas at the equator, uh, at the uh, poles, you'll see that we have a deficit. In other words, the absorbed short wave radiation is essentially much less than the outgoing long wave radiation at those latitudes. What does that mean if we've got an excess there and a deficit there? Well, effectively, if that situation were to continue, the temperature in this grey region at these latitudes would simply increase and increase and increase and keep on increasing. Whereas at the poles, it would mean that the temperature would continue to fall continuously. But of course, the planet's atmosphere tries to control this process by essentially bringing everything into equilibrium. And how does it do that? Well, effectively what it means is that we have to have heat transfer. So we've got that surplus of energy between about 35 to 40 north and south. And we've got this deficit at higher latitudes towards the poles. So we must be transporting heat from that region to this region. And that's how we can increase the temperature in those high latitude regions to uh, essentially maintain equilibrium of this whole Earth atmosphere <coughs> system. So that's extremely important, obviously. And of course, it's that heat transfer that's key to how the atmosphere works and also, as we'll see, the ocean to some extent. So, those are the key points that you need to be aware of. We've got this local mean temperature close to the equator. It's not increasing with time, so of course we have to transport heat to the latitude region. So we've got this poleward transport of heat. How do we do that? Well, it's mainly by the atmosphere, but also the ocean contributes as well. And that has to transport heat away from the equator to the pole, and that essentially maintains higher temperatures at those higher latitudes, greater than 50 degrees, say, than would normally be possible if we had a simple static equilibrium system, as shown in that previous figure. <coughs> so the question then is, well, what are the consequences of that heat transfer? How does it affect the surface temperature change with latitude? And of course, it's going to have consequences for the flow within the atmosphere as well. Well, we're going to look at some pictures now. And what you're going to see are the so-called annual cycles, 
of absorbed solar radiation, or ASR, the outgoing long wave radiation to space, or the OLR, and the net radiation at the top of the atmosphere, the difference between the up and down welling, or TOA. And they're going to be shown in the following figures. What I want you to do as part of your homework when you read this is to try and link the statements that we'll be making with the features within each of those figures and make sure you can understand and identify them. So remember, you should be looking for things like surfaces like deserts, snow and ice. They're going to have a high albedo, very good at reflecting radiation. They're not going to absorb very much solar radiation. So think about how that's going to affect the ASR and OLR. The main de departure from latitudinal symmetry, as we'll see, is due to regions of persistent clouds. You can see a lot of those over the Amazon, Indonesia, in the Pacific region, around about 10 degrees north. You can also see some examples in the Eastern Pacific and the Gulf of India, so try and look for those. The ASR differences between two different seasons, which we call JJA, June, July, August, and December, January, February, DJF, as we'll see, can be quite large, sometimes in excess of 200 watts per meter squared. That essentially dominates the, uh, highlights the dominance of the solar input. Uh, affecting the seasonal differences. When we look at the OLR, the long wave, it actually, as we'll see, is much more uniform with latitude and season. Careful about the scale on the, these diagrams. That essentially varies due to the fact that we've got lots of strong deep convection in certain latitudes, mainly around the equator. And of course, those, that very deep, strong convection produces very deep clouds, and those cloud tops are very cold. I think about what that means for the OLR. Conversely, the dry cloud-free regions, for example, over the Sahel region, Arabia, etc., those are where most of the radiation escapes back to space. And what we're going to see when we subtract the two JJA and DJF patterns to look at the difference, we're actually going to highlight something called the intertropical convergence zone, which is extremely important. And what you'll see is a band of negative outgoing long-wave radiation, which is a semi-permanent region, which is effectively where most of this convection tends to occur in the equatorial region. And that, of course, is going to reduce the outgoing long-wave radiation to space because we've got these very deep clouds. Now, in the tropics, the differences between the two seasons, as we see, are related to changing convection patterns in various mid-latitudes, and that's more a function of the change in temperature as a function of latitude. So this is the first one, the ASR. So JJA is at the top, and these are averages over several years, 1985 to 1989. The middle one is DJF, the units here are in watts per meter squared, and you can see the big shift from JJA to DJF. You can see some of those features we pointed out, particularly over the Sahel and Arabia region, you can see them over the Pacific, Indonesia, etc. But you'll notice we have very strong red regions over the Pacific uh, and Atlantic regions about the, just north of the equator. If we then shift to GJF, then you can see that then migrates downwards, as we'll see in a little video later, shifts downwards, leaving the um, ASR for the higher latitudes significantly lower as a result. If we then subtract those two graphs, remember the scale is a little bit different here now, again you can see effectively that it's dominated in the northern hemisphere where, of course, most of the land is. So that's the absorbed solar radiation, essentially, is dominated on an annual basis in the northern hemisphere. Let's look at the long-wave OLR in the same fashion. And again, you can see that the latitudinal variation is a little bit more uniform. But, as we mentioned, when we subtract the two, we've got this big band of negative or rather, yes, negative values, and that represents a big reduction in the upgrade of non-wave radiation, leading to that excess we talked about. And of course, 
And this is what we call the intertropical convergence zone. So along this region is where we tend to get this semi-persistent convective region producing lots of very deep clouds. And indeed, you can see how those ASR and OLR patterns vary as we move throughout the season. Now, the remaining cloud feature, when we look at these patterns, is the net radiation, which is on the right. And that's, the and that's due to, effectively, the stratocumulus cloud decks, which are semi-permanent across the cold oceans, colder ocean waters, which we talked about previously. Those low clouds reflect radiation appreciably, but they have little effect on the outgoing long-wave radiation. And we can see some of those effects off the coast of South America, California, and South Africa. So play those and go through them and try and identify those different periods. You can also see the Sahara Desert over there on the net actually is again consistent with it being a very dry, cloud-free region. So it's also very bright and reflects solar radiation. So we have a, what's called a net radiation deficit uh, in that region. So remember, convective clouds in that intertropical convergence zone are very bright, so they're going to reflect solar radiation, but they also are very cold, so they're going to reduce the outgoing long wave radiation in this region here. There will be some migration about the season, and that's due to what we'll, call later, what we'll look at later called the happy, the happy cell circulation. Okay, so remember, the cloud signature in the ASR is well matched by that in the OLR signal. If we just look at the net radiation, there is a, an approximate calculate, uh, cancellation. Sorry. In particular, those very high clouds in the convective regions, they reflect solar radiation, but they are also very cold, so they reduce the outgoing long-wave radiation. Cold things reduce outgoing long-wave radiation. So the main cloud signature in the net radiation are these low stratocumulus effects, which we talked about extensively previously and these tend to be semi-permanent over these cold ocean waters. And we talked about those in the last lectures. And remember the Sahara Desert region has a very high outgoing long wave radiation because it's dry, cloud-free, and warm. And you've got all these intervening, uh, uh, intervening uh, intermediary uh, uh, conditions depending on the types of surface and the latitude. And again, if we look at the average net radiation, the difference, again, you can see effectively a big shift as we move from the northern hemisphere to the southern hemisphere. But the net is dominated in a positive sense by the northern hemisphere, whereas most of the ocean is dominated by a negative net radiation. OK. What about what happens to that absorbed heat energy at the surface? Well, remember, the absorbed energy, as we mentioned, is going to be transformed into sensible and latent heat energy. Over land, that manifests as increases in temperature or evaporation. And the partitioning between those two depends on the amount of water vapor, usually moisture on the ground or in the air or on the vegetation, etc. Now, in the tropical regions, in the summertime, the land warms relative to the ocean, much more strongly than the ocean. So we have this big temperature gradient between the oceans and the land. And that temperature gradient is what drives the monsoon systems, which we'll learn about in other courses. Of course, we're going to evaporate water from the ocean surface. That's going to cool the ocean. Water vapour, and thus latent heat energy associated with it, is obviously going to be able to be transported over very large distances. So we're taking that energy, we're converting it, and we're transporting it through the atmosphere, but then we can remove it by formation of precipitation. So that provides a very efficient heat transport mechanism. We can also get increases in temperature, which cause an increase in the internal energy of the atmosphere. That will cause it to expand. And that change and changes the altitude. So the altitude of the troposphere, for example, at the equator is significantly higher than at the polar regions. By doing that, we're effectively changing the potential energy of the atmosphere. 
to much higher potential energy. And the combination of these internal and potential energy changes can be expressed uh, by enthalpy or sensible heat, which we showed the average values for in the energy budget diagram. So those are very important for local regional processes, but also for long-range transport. So this picture now shows uh, the typical sensible heat flux across the globe as a function of month of the year on average. At the bottom we have the latent heat flux, and you can see that the latent heat flux is very high, particularly over the oceans, where you get lots of evaporation and transport, but also over some of these continental regions where we've got lots of vegetation. Compare that to the sensible heat flux, which seems to be a bit more uniform, but we tend to have higher sensible heat, for example, <coughs> over regions where in the north of Africa, Arabia, etc., etc. And then the net, the difference is shown there. So the amount that's stored is of the amount of energy that's actually going to be stored prior to release is shown in this final diagram here. And again, you can see this migration to the northern hemisphere as we go throughout the day. And then as we go back to later in the year, we see a reversal. So go through those pictures and make sure that you understand some of the processes that are going on. Now we talked about the heat transfer and we said that the ocean is actually going to do most of the transporting. Uh, sorry, the, the atmosphere does most of the transporting. It's not quite true that the latitude is very close to the equator. So the black line here shows the total heat transport in petawatts. Um, negative as we go to the southern hemisphere, northern as we go to the northern, uh, uh, northern hemisphere, that polar region. And you notice that we have a very strong increase as we move away from the equator in terms of the total, and then it reduces as we go back down to <coughs> about 80, 90 degrees. And you notice the peak is around about 30 to 40 degrees in each case. Now the dashed line shows the contribution of that heat transport by the atmosphere. And you can see that it pretty much dominates, except in these narrow regions of around about plus or minus 10 degrees latitude. There, we have to rely on the ocean. So, most of the heat transport forwards takes place by the atmospheric circulation, but a significant fraction near the equator, whereas we see the Hadley cell, which forms, only weakly transport, transfers heat forwards, and that transport then has to be dominated, as we can see there, by other processes, which is mainly through surface waters in the ocean. Now, the ocean surface heat transport is mainly due to the winds in that region blowing across the ocean. And as we'll see, due to what's called a convergence zone, those winds actually blow easterly from the east towards the west along the uh, equatorial region. And as they blow across the surface, they, of course, are going to transport heat. Let's go through that, as we said, most of it takes most of the heat transport is through the atmosphere. A significant fraction near the equator is due to the Hadley cell, but it only weakly transports heat forwards initially. So we have to rely on surface waters to do some of that transport. That transport by the ocean is due to wind blowing across the sea surface, driving surface water currents. <coughs> The oceans, remember, are very good at storing heat energy across a very wide range of time scales, sometimes as long as a thousand years, and then they eventually transport that heat to other locations, as we'll see later. And the way they do it is they set up a circulation pattern within the ocean, which we call thermohaline circulation. And that thermohaline circulation actually links various oceans and can typically store heat for thousands of years, so it's very important. Now, the strongest component of the thermohaline circulation actually is in the Atlantic Ocean, compared to, say, the Pacific Ocean. The strength of that circulation depends not just on temperature gradients and the winds blowing across the surface, but actually also depends, as we'll see, on the salinity of the ocean. How much salt is there in the water? And of course, 
the Pacific Ocean has actually got less salt in it compared to the Atlantic Ocean. What that means is that in the Pacific Ocean, the circulations generally are shallower compared to the Atlantic. So the Atlantic Ocean dominates the thermohaline circulation. As we said, this is largely due to differences in salinity. Remember, the atmosphere transports water vapor away from the Atlantic across the isthmus at the equator, uh, across the isthmus in Central America, from the Atlantic to the Pacific. All that salt water, when you evaporate salt water, what happens? You leave behind the salt. The salt doesn't go with the water vapor, so you essentially transport the water vapor along those easterly wind flows across the, uh, along the uh, equator, leaving behind slightly denser, more saline water in the Atlantic Ocean. So the Atlantic is somewhat denser, and that actually affects, to some extent, these circulation patterns. We can look at that later. Okay, we're beginning to catch up. Okay, so what does the circulation pattern setup actually look like? And how does it affect the actual ocean circulation and the transport of heat? Well, we're going to go back in time a little bit to some laboratory experiments which were conducted in the 1970s. Things haven't changed very much since then. And what we're going to do is look at a little experiment where they took a drum um, full of water or a fluid injected with dye. And what they did was they're going to subject that container to a temperature gradient. So they're going to heat the outer wall of the drum, which has got water in it, and then there's a central part where they're going to maintain it at a colder temperature than the outer wall. And we're going to look down on top of that drum and look at some photographs of the circulation patterns identified by street patterns due to density changes in the fluid. Now, of course, if the drum is static, any hot fluid near the hot walls is going to rise up vertically, then it's going to move radially in towards the cold central wall where it's going to start to sink. And then as it returns down to the bottom, it's then going to return back to the warmer wall. So we get this vertical circulation pattern set up. But something different happens when we start to rotate the drum. So what we're trying to do is simulate the rotation of the earth and look at the impact it has on the fluid dynamics, the patterns of the fluid flow. Now, when we have low rotation speeds about the central axis, we get what's called axiometric, axiometric uh, flow. Let's just go to the pictures now. So, top left shows the low rotation speed, where we have more or less upright convection. We start to rotate that drum, what happens? We get these long, thin streaks, and we get this symmetric pattern. So these are what are called actually symmetric flow, and most of the heat transport from the hot outer wall to the inner cold wall is essentially across the boundaries of those layers. And that symmetrical flow, you can see in picture A, well, that occurs from a balance between the Coriolis effects, the effects of the Coriolis effects in the rotating frame of reference, and the so-called radial pressure gradients that arise from the variations in the fluid density with temperature. Remember, there's a temperature gradient here. As we gradually rotate the drum at higher and higher speeds, those boundary layers start to become thinner, and thin boundary layers are not as efficient at transporting heat in these fluids. And what that means is that those symmetrical motions become less efficient at transporting heat from the outer to the inner wall. What does that mean? Well, things change. And what we see is we have these so-called non axisymmetric motions or perturbations produced. And those wave-like motions, those meandering patterns, are actually much better at transporting heat because those meandering wave-like patterns are going to have high and low velocity associated with different parts of them. And of course the high velocity parts are very good at transporting heat. So that's the most effective way 
of getting rid of heat from the hot wall to the centre of that cylinder. As we increase the rotation speeds even more, you can see that those nice patterns start to break down and effectively what we get is called sloping convection. In other words, that's upright convection in the absence of rotation, which tends to dominate, so essentially things start, starts to boil. If you look down on your kettle, that's what tends to happen. So, it turns out that both those symmetric and wave-like perturbation flows are observed in our atmosphere. Near the equator, <coughs> the rotation effects of the planet are actually quite small. Whereas at higher latitudes, we tend to start to see these wave-like motions beginning to appear, and with some slope and convection. And it turns out that this symmetrical flow regime is what we call the Hadley Center, near the equatorial region. And of course, we have this strong convective uplift due to strong heating there. Air rises due to that, and of course, eventually, that air is going to hit the uh, tropopause, so we're capped by the stratosphere to some extent. And effectively what happens is that that air then has to spread out. So initially slowly, but then more and more. So that is going to form what we call the Hadley circulation. But what happens to the air as it starts to spread out and moves towards the pole? That's our heat transport to some extent. Well, the poleward moving air is going to be affected by the Coriolis force. And that Coriolis force increases with latitude. And what it's going to do is it's going to turn low level, returning low level flow westwards. We'll see that in the figure in a moment. And that's what produces these easterly trade winds along the equator. Now, if the Earth didn't rotate, we'd only have one big cell <coughs> between the equator and the <coughs> pole. However, because we've got the Coriolis effect due to the rotation of the Earth, then that's going to direct poleward moving air to the right in the northern hemisphere, and that's going to prevent the air from reaching the pole. And that air is also cooling and descending, so it's actually going to start to descend again. And it descends a long way before it reaches the polar regions, <coughs> around about 35 degrees or so. So that heat transport is limited by the rotation to some extent. So how do we get the heat to go even further? Well, of course, we're going to have to set up another cell. So remember, symmetric flow at all latitudes would imply an easterly surface flow at all latitudes. It doesn't happen, as we'll see. That would actually decelerate the rotation of the Earth due to frictional drag for our physicist friends. That would alter the length of the day as because, because the total angular momentum of the Earth in the atmosphere system has to remain constant. But that's just an interesting note. So let's have a look at the picture just to make sure you understand what's going on. This is the equatorial region where I remember that intertropical convergence zone produce, it, it occurs. So at the equator we have this strong heating, strong convection, lots of clouds reducing the outgoing long wave radiation. Eventually that rising air is going to be essentially uh, cool, it's going to be stopped by the tropopause below the stratosphere, and then it's going to try to move out. So if we just look at this section, the uh, northern hemisphere, exactly the same thing will happen in the southern hemisphere. You can see that the air is trying to move towards the pole. But the Coriolis force, due to rotation, pushes that wind to the right. Eventually, it's going to start to sink. What does that do? Well, remember, rising air means we have a region of low pressure. Descending air means we have a region of high pressure. As the air sinks, of course, it's then got to then move back out again. And the air that moves back towards the low pressure region at the equator is actually then going to turn to the right again as it moves south, and that's due to friction as the air moves over the surface. This is what we call the Hadley cell. Okay, um, I think we've run out of time. We'll start here uh, tomorrow where we'll look at a movie of the Hadley cell circulation and make sure you understand at least the Hadley cell circulation before moving on to the feral cell and the polar cell and see how all those different cells interact. Okay, thank you for coming.